here in the after sales service you will get of the uh, slides that presented during this event. The next speaker comes from Australia. She specializes in speech disorders, and she's going to introduce a study in which French families are the uh, most represented. Uh, welcome, Professor Angela Morgan. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me to speak here today. It's really such a pleasure. And I'll be talking about speech and language development in children with DDX3X syndrome. We have studied some boys with the condition, but Malou Kennis will talk later about the experiences of boys. So today my presentation is focused on females. And I'd just really like to thank Alana and Lottie, two talented PhD students in my team. You may have heard, uh, had many emails from either Alana or Lottie and they really did the hard work today. Why is a speech pathologist from Australia here today? Well, uh, we have a lab, that's some of my team members up there, where our labour of love is really studying speech and language and how we can help children's speech and language development in children with rare conditions. So that's why I'm here. We have a research institute uh, that is also based at a children's hospital there. And we also have the University of Melbourne which is Australia's leading medical university on the same campus. So we've got teaching, research and clinical practice, and I still work as a clinician. I wanted to uh, really make a, a point here about the fact that speech and language, the terms are often used interchangeably in society, but to a speech pathologist, these are very separate terms. And why is that important? It's really important because you need a specific diagnosis for your child to optimize the specific therapy, get that targeted therapy sooner rather than later. And it's only through targeted therapies, not just playing and encouraging, but really targeted therapies that we will make a difference. So when we talk about speech, it's quite intuitive. Uh, we're talking about the production of, or articulation of the sounds of our language. So how we use our lips, mouth, tongue to produce those sounds. When we talk about language, we're more talking about content and form. So the meaning of what we're saying. Do children have a good understanding of words, their vocabulary? How are they using the grammar of their language? Are they using grammar appropriately? Building up sentences. And it's also the comprehension which Valentin talked about, as well as expression of words, sentences, and also social skills, word finding difficulties. All of this encompasses language. And that's what we'll be talking about today. We had, um, again, working in rare conditions, fantastic to have the collaborations that we have because we have to um, try and work with families all across the world. So just like the Jen Ida study, we also use a very online platform. We try and meet with most of our families, but language is of course a challenge. Uh, and you see here, we had 38 individuals in this study uh, and around half or more of the families were French. So a very sincere thanks to you. The French really took part. And that was also um, from help with Jan Ida as well, as you'll see later. So the mean age of people in this study is 8.7 years. For those of you interested in the specific gene change or spelling error, see here that we had a range of uh, gene changes that were across the group. And for those people interested around in the missense variants, David spoke earlier about the two functional domains of the gene and 10 of the um, individuals who had missense variants had those variants in the two functional domains here. Um, and the three remainder uh, remaining changes were just outside those regions there. This is a very busy slide. I have loved Helene's the beautiful um, template, so I've gone with the colour here. But really all I wanted to show was that, you know, thank you so much to the families because you are the ones completing all of these um, assessments, working harder than the clinicians. If you look at those two columns over here, families working hard. We do include children who are minimally verbal, um, so we'll talk a bit more about, there was a great question about absent speech versus speech earlier. 
And I wanted to say a big thanks to Jen Ida, who also helped us really connect with the French families. I'll focus mainly on speech and language, which we've collected, but we'll also talk a little about feeding difficulties as well, which is something that speech pathologists also work with. So we'll, we'll start to talk about speech and language in a moment, but I really wanted to emphasise the importance of overall movement skills, because as we know, children with DDX3X syndrome are born with low muscle tone, so hypotonia, as it's called in the medical literature. And that low muscle tone is really pervasive and that really can persist over time. And that low muscle tone we know um, is really a challenge for further fine movement skills and we see delays in walking, et cetera. But it also has tremendous impacts on speech and also feeding development. So I just want to emphasise how important occupational therapy and physiotherapy is actually for stabilising, supporting the motor system and helping also with speech and feeding skills. Also, further to the low muscle tone, children with DDX3X syndrome can have difficulty planning and programming the movements that they might like to complete. So they might know that they could draw around a circle and think that, you know, they could understand what that task requires, but actually planning their hand and programming that and executing that is really difficult. And that also can translate to speech. There's a speech disorder, speech apraxia, which I'll also talk about. So you can see when you're trying to understand the condition altogether, that movement, underlying movement or motor skills, as we call them, it's really important as well for speech and feeding. So I said I'll just put, talk a little bit about feeding development as well. So we know in early infancy, the low tone can also have impacts on a child's ability to latch onto a bottle or breast or breastfeeding or bottle feeding, challenges with maintaining a strong suck, fatigue during feeding, and also reflux. So these are some of the early challenges. We know for some of the children with low muscle tone, low oral muscle tone with an open mouth posture, we see persistence of drooling as well. And then for some of the children, the gastrointestinal challenges of reflux, um, constipation and other issues. So all of these together over time for some children can cause aversion to feeding and delayed feeding milestones. And for some of the children, we do see that about one in five children do continue to have some forms of feeding challenges. Um, over eight years of age even. So I think that's an area where we could do a lot more work to support families actually. So speech development, Valentin showed um, very nice data from Jen Ida where you'll have more information on this, but in our cohort of 38 individuals, a large proportion of children had developed their first spoken words, not too late or beyond the typical um, year milestone. But there were still a third of children who had not developed spoken words, um, even up to 24 years of age. And that's not um, surprising, given that we understand that two in three children um, that we studied, so here it's not a longitudinal study, it's just a cross-sectional study, um, we saw that 25 of the 38 children were minimally verbal. What do we mean by minimally verbal? Um, other terms are used in the literature that I, I don't really like to use, so non-verbal or the absent speech term that somebody used, um, but we, we refer to minimally verbal being children who have less than 40 spoken words, that's spoken language. Um, and we use a tool called the communication matrix to measure what children are actually capable of doing, and they're capable of doing a lot of things and they're communicating very nicely in other forms. So we can see this tool looks at children's ability to refuse, pain, looks at social abilities and exchange of information. So all of the things that children and we all need to do with communication in life. There are seven stages on this tool, going from a very early stage of development up until using symbols, pre-symbolic and symbolic communication. So this is where we're all at here as adults in this room, very fortunate communication. Sorry, I can hear challenges with them. Um, we can see that 100% of children who were minimally verbal actually were at this pre-symbolic stage. They'd all reached this stage. 
some others had reached more abstract language, and then a, a quarter of children were able to reach that level seven of combining um, symbols, signs, or words. Well, they're not verbal, they're not speaking. How are they doing that? Well, of course, they're absolutely still communicating. They're using augmentative or alternative communication. I find this a terrible term. It's the term that's in our literature. I think we could come up with better terms than this because I think that's not a helpful term for families, but see what we are talking about. We can have unaided forms of alternative communication. So this is where we don't have any external device. We're using our own gestures or we're using formal sign language or aided where we are using some form of system, whether that's low technology so it might be a picture board, picture exchange, communication book, or high tech. So digital devices or even speech generating devices. And so I cannot emphasize enough. This is where I feel we should be doing more. We should be doing more at an earlier age for children. There is a dreadful myth that pervades globally, uh, particularly in the medical profession, not with our wonderful colleagues here, uh, but that use of these devices will inhibit verbal development. That is not the case. In fact, it encourages your speech and language development. So if you imagine, if you are only able to verbally produce one or two words, how are you going to develop the grammar, be able to practice uh, more complex and sophisticated language? We see already the children have stronger receptive or com comprehension skills. Okay, so we're inhibiting if we can't sort of support the children to then be able to also learn to produce language in a more sophisticated way. And here we see, remembering again, this is one snapshot in time, but we can look across children of different ages and see the types of communication the children are using who are minimally verbal. You can see um, in the younger age range, sign is very prevalent. And that's, you know, also for all children with typical communication development, where we use a lot of gesture in the early years. Sign continues to be heavily used up until sort of the early school years um, or middle school years rather and teenage years when you see aids and sign uh, is used more consistently and sign alone drops off because you see that aids are required because children are getting older, they're developing further and they require a greater sophistication. Also, some teens and children find signing can be more isolating if others in their environment aren't using sign, whereas sometimes the communication devices can be more um, shared with others in their environment. So I just wanted to emphasise that. But the biggest thing that we were struck by is how many children had no form of device. So these were minimally verbal children who did not really have uh, an AAC support. And I feel like this is a really lovely opportunity um, to encourage use of these alternative and augmentative forms of communication to really enhance and help with communication development. There were um, a number of children, the remainder of the group who were verbal. Only seven of those children were English speaking. And in those children, we were able to do very deep assessments with my team to look at exactly what type of speech specific diagnoses the children had. And uh, the six of the seven children had apraxia of speech. So you recall I said earlier about the underlying movement or motor control difficulties where planning and programming of movements is a core challenge. So apraxia is a speech movement disorder of planning and programming. So a child knows the word they would like to say, but they have real difficulty quickly and accurately sequencing all of the sounds together and producing a word with the correct stress pattern. So some of the features that you may have seen, the limited babbling, the delayed first words, uh, you might also see vowel errors as well as consonant errors, that's quite, um, more specific to a speech movement disorder. It runs across all of the speech sounds. Uh, inconsistency of speech. So there are two forms of that. One is where a child might use a word, they use it a couple of times and you don't really hear it again for a little while, but it might come back and then become learned and automatized and used. The other form is where a child 
might have a word, it might be a complex word like helicopter, something very challenging, or even simpler words. And each time it's produced, they have to make their own novel plan, a new plan every time. And so often you'll see differences in the production. So for a word helicopter, four syllables, very complex. You might see helitopa, heiota, hepiocta. So children add sounds, they omit sounds, they make unusual patterns. That's part of apraxia. And very frustrating for the children when they know the word and they just can't get their movement system to implement that plan accurately. The other challenge we talked about earlier was the underlying um, tone or weakness, and that goes across um, various systems that are important for speech. So if we think about um, articulation, think about prosody, the lexical stress pattern of our voice that requires a lot of fine control of pitch, our voice, and also timing. Resonance. So for some children, they might have altered resonance. So in English, in French, in other languages, we have oral and nasal sounds, and you have to very quickly make those movements. If you have a lot of weakness there, that can be very difficult to do that accurately. So you hear altered resonance for children. Respiration. So we just take it for granted, being able to talk a lot on one breath stream. For some children who have already challenges with respiration, they could only get out a few words on uh, each breath stream. And then phonation, how crisp and clear is how your vocal folds working? Do you have uh, weakness also in your vocal folds? So some of the children who have apraxia also have had um, a, a sign of dysarthria as well. Here we're going to listen to a child. Uh, she's an English speaker. She's an Australian child in our clinic. Uh, you see some of her features here, but um, in particular, you'll hear the apraxia of speech. Oh, well, we hope we would hear, Helen. <laughs> Sorry, it was working before, wasn't it? Voilà, le temps de résoudre le, le problème. Vous pourrez poser vos questions au professeur Angela Morgan à l'issue de sa présentation. While we solve the problem, you can ask your questions from Professor Angela Morgan. I believe some. So you hear young Julia. We've just made up a name for Julia. Uh, thank you, Helen. She um, starts off saying the word hippopotamus. Pardon. No, never work with animals, children, or show videos. That's the, in showbiz, don't they say that? <laughs> videos are always problematic. What's the long way of thinking? Hippopotamus. Excellent. I don't know, he's been thinking about it. It's the long way of thinking. Hippopotamus. These, the hippopotamus. So we're missing out some sounds. We're not entirely clear, but my goodness out a word like hippopotamus. The next thing she says is one other short word. Oh, sorry, everyone. Jamas, so for pajamas, she said jamas, so missing off um, the first sound, something that we hear. The next word that she's going to say is a very nice illustration of the word finding difficulties that we sometimes see. So um, she sees a picture of a triangle but you'll hear how she produces that word. And she's given prompts from Olivia in my team who was seeing Julia at the time, as we will call her. Uh, you'll hear Olivia prompting her the first sound and then giving her a bit more of the, the word. And you can see how challenging it still is um, for this young lady. And, and that word finding often can happen with apraxia. Uh, there are similar regions of the brain in which these features are um, underpinned. What shape? So a scare. It's a scare. She said a scare. She was trying to say a square right off the bat. So she pulled something, retrieved a word that was not right. And now it's hard for her to actually go back to retrieve the word that is correct. So she sort of perseverates a little bit on square. A 
A. I heard you say the first sound. E. Yeah. In um. Triangle. Yes, got it. So nice to hear when she gets the word in the end. But you can see she knew the word. But what a communication breakdown, how long it is and how hard it is to wait. Um, but fantastic that she got there in the end. But that's very illustrative of the difficulties that can be seen. The next young lady we'll call Sam. Uh, she has apraxic errors as well, but she also very much has the dysarthria. So you'll hear her voice is a little tremulous. She's not crisp, crisp and clear in what she's saying, but she has a bit more accuracy in the speech sound she's using. Daddy will sleep all day. Did anyone hear what she said? Daddy will sleep all day. Dropping in, Dad. <laughs> Daddy had a haircut. Daddy had a haircut. And then she said, Daddy had a haircut and then we ride home. So hard to understand, but you can see how tremulous she is. Um, and she does have tonal issues as well. And that's more the dysarthria coming across um, for little Sam. Sorry, you didn't see her up there. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's frozen. That's fine. You have time. Sorry. Long way to get it on this. Excellent. One of these things that you went to bed. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes. 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 She was just playing with the table. She doesn't have such a severe movement or motor disorder that that was part of her tremor or anything like that. She just has a little bit of activity. Okay. So then we're moving away from speech production now to go back and look at language abilities and the Vineland, which many families don't exactly love filling in, I know, but can give us very valuable information. Here we looked at communication, language ability, relative to daily living, socialisation and movement skills. And we see the lovely um, social strengths of language actually that come through. The other thing we noted when we look further into communication was that um, receptive language, as, as Valentin already told you earlier, was more preserved than expressive language. So that's a relative strength. You can see this, that children, um, Without DDX, 3X in the general population, this would normally be the typical range. So yes, we see language is reduced, but still there are some strengths that we can focus on. Uh, we also did a deeper dive into language here. Um, this tool, the Children's Communication Checklist, looks at grammar. So how are children combining words? Are they using the correct grammar for their language? The semantics we talked about or vocabulary. Coherence, so when children are speaking with you, are the topics a little bit tangential or is there a nice flow to the conversation? Imitation, ability to imitate. Stereotyped utterances, so these are things like, hi, good morning, see you later, bye. 
So there's a real strength there for those stereotyped utterances. And part of that reason can also be because you've produced them so many times in terms of your speech or your sign or your other systems that they've become more automatized. So the apraxic um, elements to the condition have reduced by so many practices. So that's really important to note. Um, and maybe also from the, an autism perspective as well, where we see stereotyped utterances. Um, we also see strengths in nonverbal, of course, social skills and also interests, specific interests that the children have. So really the take home messages, um, yes, you know, the term absent speech isn't a great term. There's a bit of a challenge with the human phenotype ontology. So what is that? That's what medical professionals use on their electronic medical records. Um, and there are a set number of descriptors and we're working with the HPO who are, who are really fabulous and enjoy collaboration to improve the HPO terms for speech and language at the moment because a term like absent speech is really unhelpful and not accurate enough. Uh, other terms you'll often see are just delayed speech and language, which also doesn't tell you anything really in terms of specificity. So um, we're working to try and improve that. But we do still see many of the children are minimally verbal, but they have you know, more preserved receptive language understanding. They also have social motivation as a real strength as well. So all of these things really tell us that use of aids and devices are going to help to give the children more of an opportunity to develop more sophisticated expressive language as well and try and bring the expressive language up with where the receptive language is. Also the high rates of speech motor disorders, they require a really specific type of speech therapy. It's not just going along and practicing sounds. There are set intensive programs um, that children can be using. There are now randomized controlled trials in the field of speech pathology, which were lacking for a long time to show the benefit of these types of really targeted therapies. So prompt therapy, um, dynamic tactile temporal cueing. These are therapies we'd be happy to talk about and share information on further, but these really um, will help to um, encourage and improve uh, speech and language development. So I wanted to say a huge thanks. One of my um, best phone Zoom calls during the whole of COVID was with David Genevieve's group. David reached out to us because he could see nice synchrony between our groups. Um, and that's really why I'm here today. Uh, also, Boris Shomet, who's working with some of um, my other do doctoral students at the moment. Um, and a huge thanks um, to the different um, support groups and also to the participating families, because I think, as Valentin and David have nicely said this morning, really the work wouldn't happen without your support. So thank you. Thank you, Angela Morgan. Uh, we've got a question online uh, in Spanish. So Justine Wakili, she's uh, Spanish, French and English. He's translating right now from uh, reading the question and translating in or formulating it in English, unless you've got your headset. Uh, as you want, but Justine is in the starting block. Sinon, mesdames, messieurs, le temps qu'on qu assimile la question, y a-t-il une question dans la salle? Ladies and gentlemen, otherwise, do you have any question from the room? Hello, can you hear me? Thank you very much for your uh, speech. Uh, uh, okay, lovely. An online platform that we could contribute to. Would it be possible to share the link to the platform or is it via oh, the Genida? For uh, the Genida? Yeah. Um, so Genida were part of our study, but we also had our own separate um, work. And would it be for, possible for French children to contribute? Yes, yes. Via Sorry, video I, I or... didn't talk further on that, but absolutely. So okay. I think there were 16 or 17 French individuals out of the 38. Uh, we also had Spanish families, German families, Dutch families. So we translate our surveys into many different languages. Yeah. So, yes, if you're interested in... Um, taking part, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we just have had the paper um, reviewed po quite positively, but it's under a second round review as they require. Um, so that may come out soon, but yes, we'd still, so we'll have the paper out 
but we'll still keep collecting data. Um, okay. So that would be lovely. Thank you. Yeah.